you've got your copy of God's Word, we're going to pick up where we left off in Acts chapter 18. I only got through really only talking about one verse. Um, we're just going to look at verses 9 through 17. And I'm not going to comment a whole lot on verse 9 because I spent a whole sermon last week. and um, I've never had to do this. Now, when I was sitting under Pastor Bumpers at Crossway, he, he did that often. He'd preach a sermon on Sunday morning. He wouldn't get finished with all of it. And he used to say, you come back tonight to hear the rest, and he'd, he'd have to finish it that night. But uh, I've never had to do that, and I've done my best not to try to do that with sermons. Not saying that's right or wrong, just not a way I'm comfortable operating. But I'm going to read verses 9 uh, through 11, and uh, then I'm going to pray, and uh, we'll get into this. It says, Then spake the Lord to Paul in the uh, night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he, and he continued there a year and six months teaching them the word of God among them. So we're going to talk about part two of confident living tonight. So let's go Lord to the word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. God, I pray you would uh, take this time and use it. Help draw us closer to you. Um, my heart tonight is that we would line up with you that we would um, allow what we're looking at tonight to shape us and to conform us into who you want us to be. Have your will and way in the remaining time in our service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now when I started out last week, I talked about a uh, shark that was out in the water and how a, a dog went after the shark and barked its little head off at it and the shark swam away and the dog came back up off to the out of the water like you know it was no uh, no big deal for him and he faced that with a lot of confidence i better make sure my phone's off because i put the slide up there and i'll probably be the first one that the, my phone would go off but uh that dog had a lot of confidence so to kind of transition tonight uh a little bit we uh last week we looked at um comfort from the lord and how he brings comfort so that's what we're going to pick up at and how uh, the apostles here, especially, excuse me, Paul is told to, to uh, not be afraid and to not be afraid of what God's going to do and how God wants to use him. Um, and how the disciples needed similar assurance when they saw uh, Jesus walking on the water in Mark chapter 6 verses 49 and 50 says, And when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit. So well, these guys are out on the sea. And I don't know why it is, but when I was a kid coloring stuff in Sunday school, I always thought of this time of Jesus walking on water like it was a nice spring day. But it was anything but that. And when Peter got out on the water, I've seen these pictures of you know Peter out walking on the water. Uh, that was It was a water most of us would have been scared at and probably would have been seasick tossing our cookies. And, and Peter, you know, to his credit, gets out and, and he walks out to Jesus later here, but it says they thought they'd seen a spirit, and they cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And we see this comfort from the Lord, which is supposed to help us do the second thing I want to talk about in, in this passage, is the commandment from the Lord. We see that in verse 9, that, that there's a commandment. That uh, God gives him a vision, and that gives him a vision to go out and speak. But notice here that God gave comfort before He gave the commandment. He gave comfort before He gave the commandment. Um, Matthew twenty-eight, eighteen, and nineteen. He tells them Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, "All power is given unto me in heaven and earth." Go ye therefore and teach all nations, making disciples of them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So he gives a commandment here, and this commandment is to go and speak. Um, back in Acts chapter 5, verses 19 through 20, it tells us, But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go stand and speak in the temple of, uh, as temple, excuse me, to the people all the words of this life. As D.L. Moody walked down Chicago, a street one day, he saw a man who was leaning against a lamppost. This evangelist gently put his hand on the man's shoulder and asked him if he was a Christian. The fellow raised his fist, fist and angrily said to D.L. Moody, Mind your own business! And D.L. Moody says, I'm sorry if I've offended you. 
But to be very frank, sir, whether or not you're saved is my business. Even if people reject the gospel, we must still love them. And that's easy to say in a sermon. It's easy to get up on a pulpit. And, and uh, I've, I've been in churches where a preacher will say that a certain way. Or they go, amen, preacher, we got to love them, even if they reject us. And they go out and they get rejected and they you know, start treating people like trash. So it's, it's, it's easy to get up. It's easy to say to a Sunday school class. And it ought to be easy to say in church. Because we do need to be saying that and, and, and encouraging one another with that. But it's another to go out to our jobs. It's another to go out to the store. I tell you where, where I've, I'm blessed to work at a Christian place. Well, it's Christian for the most part. But I tell you what, where I've about lost my testimony is Walmart. That's where I struggle. Is Walmart. I had a Walmart employee one time. I was pushing my cart, minding my own business. And this guy was out cleaning some mess. And he grabs my cart and shoves it down the aisle. This is a Walmart employee. Grabs my cart and shoves it down the, down the aisle. Well... I, I try to be pretty easy going. You know how I am. I try to be pretty easy going. And I just kind of stopped and looked at him like this. I said, you could have said excuse me. And I went on. And uh, I, I wanted to say more, but I'm like, no, I'm, I'm not. I'm not I'm, it's not going to go well if I say more. It won't go well for him, and it probably won't go well for me either. But there's that commandment to speak. There's that commandment to, to go and tell. And it's not easy to go and tell. I tell you what, if when people come to my door, if I don't know who you are, I don't know that I answer the door, to be honest with you. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't go door to door. When weather gets where it stabilizes a little more, we're going to try to go out a Saturday a month at least, maybe two Saturdays a month. But, uh, you know, my kids, I've said this before, my kids, they'll, they'll go. I don't know if anybody, I don't know that Angie trained them or who trained them. They'll go. They'll go. They like talking to the Alexa doorbells, though. Yeah. See, I don't want to talk to Alexa. I'm like, nope, here, you can talk to Alexa. I don't want to talk to, uh, to technology. Huh? It's awkward. Well, not, for, not for those two, it's not. It is awkward for me. So we see that there's a commandment to speak and there's a commandment to action. Sometimes we can be frozen by paralysis of analysis. You ever heard that before? Paralysis of analysis, meaning that we just analyze things and we just kind of get stuck analyzing things. There's a lot of church growth gurus that I think get like this very easily. They'll, they'll, they'll run these stats and, and, and different things and, and we just get stuck in a rut. We get stuck in a rut just analyzing things. He tells them here though that for the action that no man will hurt these. From 2 Timothy 4, 16 and 17 says, for, or excuse me, at my first answer, no man stood with me. Paul could understand that because he nobody did stand with him. But all men forsook me. Now Paul's not having a pity party here. Let's, let's get this straight. Paul's not saying, look at me. Feel sorry for me. No, Paul's just saying, look, I can relate to you. This is how I felt. I want you to understand I can relate to you. And Paul didn't want anyone that was going out trying to be a witness for the Lord. He didn't want anyone to feel discouraged. He wanted you to feel like you could charge hell with a squirt gun. So that's, that's, that's why he's relating these things. And he says, I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. These people forsook Paul and he says, don't lay it to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be uh, fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. We could talk about the mouth of the lion for a while, but Paul had proven he was willing to suffer physically to preach the gospel. But in Corinth, God was going to protect him from all the threats that were made against him. And God not only says no man will hurt thee, but he tells him that there's much people in that city. God has a purpose in regard of the salvation of sinners. In his foreknowledge, he knew that Paul was going to have a fruitful ministry here in this city. Based on God's promises, Paul continued in Corinth a year and six months. It was one of the longest periods of time he would stay in one place on his missionary journeys. He was now confident that he was under the special protection of God and therefore continued the preaching of the Word, the doctrine of God. It is very likely that it was during his stay here that he wrote that first epistle to the Thessalonians. And the second one, not long after that. Some think that... Uh, I thought I had this. Oh, there we go. Some think that uh, he... Well, there we go. Some think that... Well, I left out a thought there. 
I'm with my notes again. Some things that the epistle was written to the Galatians during his stay at Corinth. He had to settle the issue of fear before he could even go on to a greater ministry. So we see that there's a verb here in... uh, Oh, where was this at? We'll go down to verse number 10 through 17 and uh, talk about the companionship of the Lord here. Um, We read through verse 11. Let's pick up at 12 and go down to verse 17. And when Galileo was made the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Galileo said unto the Jews, or Galileo said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, lewdness, O ye Jews, reason uh, would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, look ye into it. For I will be no judge of these matters. And he uh, drove, them, drove them from the judgment seat. In verse 17, Then all the Greeks took uh, Sochtenes, the chief ruler in the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Galileo cared for none of those things. So we see about the companionship of the Lord, we see His presence that... that uh, He made a promise to Paul. He said, I will be with thee. And the idea here is I will attend, meaning I'm going to be present, I'm going to bless, I'm going to protect you. God without man is still God, but man without God is nothing. We've got to have the Lord on our side. We've got to be yielded to Him. Hebrews 13, 5-6 says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For He hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may say boldly, or so that we may boldly say, "The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me." These guys, when we're reading this, these guys are very seriously, very sinister, like, and and in very manipulating ways, go after Paul. They go after not just Paul, but they go after the leader of the, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and they beat him before the judgment seat. But yet the, the Galileo, the guy who was, um, what did it say, he was, he was the deputy of Achaia, he didn't get involved. He said, hey, it's your guys' deal, you sort it out. This is a guy that's supposed to be keeping the law, in the sense of keeping law and order. But he's, he says, I'm not going to judge your law. And then he watches this guy get beat, and he just kind of distances himself. God gave Paul very specific words to encourage him in his ministry in Corinth. And this, these things, these promises, excuse me, these promises that he was given helped him overcome his apprehension to do a great work for God. We live in a day where there's a lot of apprehension. We live in a time where... Um, for, for just different reasons. We don't have time to probably go into them. But ministry, it's not looked at the way it was years ago. It's really not. Linda and I have talked about this. And I've talked about this with a, a deacon out, at, um, out of Buck Prairie out there in Marionville. Um, there's a shortage of preachers. I'm sure every single one of us in here probably know of a church looking for a preacher right now. Um, at any given time, and I, I get email updates all the time on this stuff, um, at any given time there's about 200 pastoral openings just within the Southern Baptist Convention alone. And, and uh, some, sometimes I'm aware of independent ones and there's probably a handful of those that I just know off the top of my head and I'm not even um, closely tied with uh, some of the people in that movement that I used to be. But uh, there's a shortage of preachers. There's a shortage of, of Sunday school teachers. There's a shortage of, of everything. There's a shortage of health care workers today. Uh, within the last few years, 
I've heard stories of nurses being overworked, healthcare workers of every kind being stressed out. It's, it's not a difficult time to do anything. Even, even, uh, even at, at, your, at a typical job, COVID alone changed the way most jobs operate. Some people had to work from home, and that's, for some, that's a blessing in some ways, but I'm sure in some other ways it, it creates some unique challenges too. But Paul needed these promises to help him overcome his apprehension and do a great work for God. Paul had to settle the issue of fear before he could go on and do anything for the Lord. You know, friend, I think that uh, fear is probably what's holding a lot of people back tonight. I don't know this for a fact. I just know things I've wrestled with. Fear held me back. I'll never forget when uh, I was graduating high school. I pretty much thought I had things figured out what I was going to do. I was going to go to this uh, school that was in Topeka, Kansas, called Topeka Technical College. It doesn't exist now. I think it got absorbed into Washburn, um, in some sort of Votech school that they have now. But uh, I had some scholarships. I don't know how I got them, but I got them. And I was going to go. Signed up to get a student loan for X amount of dollars. My graduation, the guy that was my recruiter shows up at my graduation to present me it wasn't the literal thing, but it was, it was like a, those fake check type things. It was my scholarship. And uh, here I go. I'm going to sail off. I'm going to do what I want to do. Well, little did I know, about two months later, I go through, and I didn't know, it was about a month later, I go through student orientation. Everything's going as it should. I get down to about two weeks, this is in July, two weeks before classes are supposed to start. I go up there to finalize some paperwork. And I see a fridge being defrosted, people moving furniture. I didn't th think that was real odd. I thought it was kind of weird to do that in July, um, right as classes were getting ready to start, because I was going to hit the ground running. They had, a, they had a semester that started in July, and I wanted to start with that semester. So I go in there, and they said, our school is closing down. We're teaching out the students we have. And I said, but what about the ones that are starting? Oh, your, your stuff's being shredded. Shreds my loan information, all my information right in front of me. So I'm freaking out like a banshee. I get out to my car and I call my pastor and said, hey, can, we, can I sit down and talk with you? Here's, here's what's going on. So we went at Godfather's there. At, uh, I think it's on 21st and... Uh, somewhere in there, 21st Street, somewhere in Topeka. Uh, went and met this Godfather's Pizza, and I, I'm sitting there just telling my, my pastor how worried I am and how I don't know what I'm going to do now. He said, you ever thought about serving the Lord? You ever thought about going to Bible college? I said, no way, that ain't for me. He said, why isn't it? I said, I don't think I'd be very good at it. He said, God did not, doesn't ask anybody if they're any good at it. He just asks if they're willing. So why don't you think about it? So I walked away from there, kind of discouraged because I didn't hear what I wanted to hear. You know how that is. You go to somebody and you kind of want them to tell, them, tell you something you want to hear. And I didn't get told what I wanted to hear. So the next Sunday, we're having our first service in a new building. The church had been around for about three years that I was going to at that time. And uh, our first service in the building, and I'm back there in the background on the PowerPoint. God's not going to do anything to me back here in the, in the sound booth at the, running the PowerPoint. That's what I'm thinking. I'm going to be back there. Nobody's going to know I'm here as long as I hit the arrow buttons when I should. Nobody will know I exist. God will even forget about me. That's what I'm thinking. I ain't going to be up there singing. I'm not going to be up there preaching. I'm just showing up because I know I need to be here. You know, I wanted, I wanted to hear a word from the Lord. Because up until I went to that church, you know, I enjoyed when I was those kids' ages back there, but uh, uh, there was a time I didn't want to even be in church to back things up a little bit. Because I just saw, I never forget when I was in, I say that a lot, don't I? I never forget. Well, that's because a lot of things stick in my mind. 
I was probably in fifth or sixth grade, and we had switched churches, and we went to this one church that was had been around forever. I think Methuselah might have started it, uh, but uh, went there, and uh, there was this gentleman that always gave me candy. And one time we had a business meeting. He got up and he yelled at the pastor. I don't remember what he yelled at him, but I saw this man. He was angry. I never seen this man angry in my life. I'm like, what's going on? And for the first time, I saw people fight in church. I was probably 10, 10 11, 12 years old. And uh, I thought, I don't want any part of this. So I didn't grow for a while. And then I went to this church where I'm talking about where I was at now. that had been around for three years. Because the pastor, he gives you points one, two, and three, and he gave you fill-ins. So that way, if my dad said, what did the preacher preach on? Well, he preached on this, this. Here's my, I filled in my blanks. So I, could, I wouldn't just say God or Jesus or the grace of God or the Bible. So anyhow, I'm in the PowerPoint now at this three-year-old church. And uh, I'm back there. And uh, he talks about how this is marvelous in our eyes. It's the Lord's doing. It's a, that's a verse, I believe, out of uh, Psalms, if I'm not mistaken. Or somewhere else. It may not be Psalms, but it, uh, I'm, I remember the verse. just can't remember the address. These things are marvelous in our eyes. It's His doing. Or it's, it's the other way around. It's His doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. And he starts talking about what it, what it took for this church to become a church. How it was organized. How they got the, the building property. That property, they sh- that church shouldn't have got. The guy wanted a lot of money for it and that property was worth it. And he put an offer in and, and the guy said, you know, I, I can't. I'm not going to sell it for that and, and whatever. And so then he meets with the pastor and says, tell me, your, tell me your vision for your church. And he goes into a story about how they became a church and his vision. And he said, look, he said, I bought this property for X amount of dollars. He said, I just don't want to sell it at a loss. So he knocked, I don't know how many thousands off of the price for that church to even get that property. Pretty miraculous. So anyhow, I'm sitting in there, talking in the booth back there, thinking nobody's going to move me. I don't I need to worry about anything. And then the pastor says, you know, it's, not, it's time for us since this building is built. He says, it's not time for us to get comfortable. It's time for us to send people out. And that's when the hairs stand on the back of my neck. And I knew God was doing this. He's saying, it's time for you to go out. So I went. So then I thought, okay, I'm going to go, Lord. But, you know, I want to come back here and I want to I work for this pastor. I basically wanted to shine the man's shoes. That's how loyal I was at the time. I thought, I'll go, get my, I'll go get my Bible degree, and then I'll come back after I got my Bible degree. Well, I crammed four years into six, and uh, then it started being, God just put on my heart, you're not going back to Topeka. And I wrestled with God. I said, you don't understand, I've got family there. My family needs me. So I thought... I thought, that church needs me. And if you saw that church today, they don't need me. <laughs> they don't need me. They've got men smarter than me there on staff. Well, I didn't know what I was going to do. I'm going into my senior year at Baptist Bible College, not knowing what I'm going to do. So I got to California on a missions trip. And uh, I thought, man, this is exciting. I'm looking at all these towns that don't have Baptist churches in them. We went to North Hollywood. Granted, it ain't anything like Hollywood. It's North Hollywood. It is the hood. Okay? Go out there. I'm a little nervous. Every window had bars on it. Houses, businesses. All on it had bars. I'm like, what's this? I saw some things out there back in 2006 that we're just now starting to see here in the Ozarks. If you know what I mean. So I'm out there. Passing out tracks. Even passed out tracks at the beach. And the difference between passing out tracks in the Ozarks and passing out tracks out in California. People out in the Ozarks, they kind of look at the back to see what church you, you come from. You give them a track. Out in California, they open the track to see what it says. That's the difference. So I thought, you know, maybe you'll send me out there. But the longer I was out there, man, I, I was uncomfortable, really uncomfortable. I got off the plane, and I got down and kissed the ground. I'm like, I'm glad I'm back in Missouri. And I haven't, I haven't left since. 
And for some reason, God led me to, like I said, I just wanted to be an assistant. It's kind of like when you're the vice president of something. Like in politics, does the vice president ever get in trouble? No, because our president now used to be vice president, and he didn't get in trouble when he was vice president. But now that he's president, he's in everybody's crosshairs. I didn't want all the attention. I just wanted to be an assistant pastor. I just wanted to clean the toilets, mop the floor, vacuum the, vacuum the auditorium. I just wanted to do those things. I just thought, I'll make this man's life easier. But God said, no, I've got some other things other, outside of that for you. Because trust me, when I was growing up, everybody was pushing, and Mark might remember this, because uh, we were at the same church for a little while when we were younger as kids. Um, everybody was all, you need to go to Bible college for, the, for one year and you're out of school. They ever push that? You remember that being pushed? Go to Bible college for one year. And I used to say, why would I waste my time doing that when I know I shouldn't be in Bible college? I don't want all those rules. There's rules everywhere is what I learned. But there's a reason I'm sharing this. It's, some of it's for you to get to know a side of me a little bit tonight, but it's to show you, hey, I struggle with surrender too. And for, I know probably not everybody's here that probably needs to hear this, but for us to, to reach people, it's going to take all of us doing something. Every last one of us. If everybody brought one visitor, even if just two people work together to get one visitor here, our attendance would probably double. See, even if just, you, like I said, even having just one person bringing somebody, or if it takes a couple trying to really work on getting somebody here. And we get them here not, not just so that we have more numbers. Numbers do matter, but the idea is, is we believe Jesus makes a difference. And I'm up here tonight, that's why I told you all that backstory is Jesus makes a difference, that's why I want to preach. It's not because I want my name somewhere. It's because I think He makes a difference. I know He makes a difference. And what I learned from watching the pastor that I was working with that for a little while, when I was in college, I actually had a chance to go to Topeka my, after my first year. I was an intern for one summer there. And uh, I, I just watched the way the man preached. I watched the way he approached the ministry. He actually enjoyed doing ministry. Imagine that. He actually enjoyed it. And, 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 he, and he preached in such a way where he wanted Jesus to make a difference. He knew Jesus made a difference, but he wanted Jesus to make a difference in the lives of everybody that came in that building. He wanted everybody to have a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And tonight, friend, whether you're you know, I'm, I'm speaking to people that are probably most likely all saved in here tonight. I never want to take it for granted that you have that nailed down because I don't know your heart, only God does. But Jesus makes a difference. Maybe you, you need joy restored. The church at Ephesus had a big problem with that. Their problem was this, they left their first love. They left their first love. That's why marriages struggle today because the first love gets left. But Paul was able to live confidently and do ministry confidently because he had that companionship with the Lord. And there's a lot of weird stuff that went on here. All of a sudden, they're beating a guy. Um, the, 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 the Sothenes, if, you, if I'm saying his name right, Sosthenes. He didn't, what did he do? He didn't do anything wrong. He's not the one speaking, but he's the ruler in the synagogue. He's probably the one that let Paul go in there. So he's getting beaten. There's a lot of stuff going on here. And I don't think any of us are going to endure a beating. But I'm going to tell you what you are going to endure, have to endure is discouragement. Maybe even some depression. Maybe even lies from other people. Sometimes lies from other believers. I don't know about anybody else here. Sometimes I... I'd rather take a beating sometimes than, than endure attacks from people. Because the beating, I'll know that. I'm like, I'm like kids. The kids are. Sometimes man, you get a kid that's 11 or 12 years old. All right, what do you want to do? Do you want to be grounded from TV for a week? Or would you rather get a spanking? Oh, they'll take the spanking so they can go watch TV and 10 minutes later. Their kids are smart. Hey, if, if, I'm no different when I was that age too. But get, get out here. I'd, I'd even take the paddle here. Go ahead and spank me so I can go you know, do my own thing after I get done and spanked. When a kid's like that, you know, okay, you're going to have to change things up. Spanking is not working. But we endure, man, I, all you got to do is get on social media and, and, and uh, some of the attacks on there. 
it's not easy being a believer in 2024, but you know what? At the same time, we're able to do some things in 2024 that couldn't be done in Paul's day. We're able to put together music with a piano. They didn't have a piano in Acts chapter 18. They didn't have a hymn book. One of these days I'll talk about in a sermon how we got a hymn book. You know, there's some people that paid a price for us to get a hymn book. Just like, you know, we'll talk about this at some point on Sunday nights, where there was men and women that bled and died so we could have an English Bible. There were some people who paid a price for this English Bible. There was also some people that paid a price for getting us a hymnal that we get to enjoy today. The beautiful hymns. You know, when this church was started, we didn't have a piano in this church for the first... I don't know, 30 some years this church was in existence. They had no piano. They have a piano till 1928, I think it was when I was reading the other day. So from 1885 to 1928, there was no piano in this church. And that was a big deal when they got a piano. Not every church had that. So we, we've got a time when we can bust people in with vans. They couldn't do that in Acts chapter 18. We've got technology. We're able to... I didn't get it set up in time. And a lot of people that's at home anyhow are probably watching the Super Bowl anyways. But you know, I've been trying to do live stream because I know there's people that can't make it. And sometimes that live stream works really good like it did today. Then there's other days where maybe you hear about every third word. But the point is this. is We live in a time where we're able to really do some things to reach people with the gospel. We've got VBS um, lessons and videos and all sorts of stuff we can use. That stuff wasn't available in Paul. That stuff wasn't even available at this church a hundred years ago. So we, we've, got a, we've got an exciting time to minister and really dig in. So um, I'm going to go ahead and pray um, before I ramble on any more tonight, but hope tonight that something I've said can somehow help you in being confident and the sense of confidently living for the Lord, confidently Serving Him. Let's pray.